Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Rafa Jimenez, who's the blockchain guru for Elka and Secretix. Rafa has an amazing career, and you will hear about blockchain, what is an NFT, and the impact it will have on the live event industry. Enjoy my conversation with Rafa. Hello, and welcome to a new episode of the Business of Meeting podcast. And today, I am extremely happy to speak with the guru of blockchain, crypto, <laughs> NFT, uh, anything related to that. We finally got to understand what it means, uh, what those words means, but more importantly, how they are impacting the live event industry. Ladies and gentlemen, Rafa Jimenez, Mr. Blockchain for the group Elka and Secutix. How are you, Rafa? I'm doing good, Eric. No pressure with that great intro. intro. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure before we start, uh, I just mentioned the uh, LK, which is the, the IT group uh, in Switzerland, which owns Secutix. We're both in the same group. Yeah. Uh, as I just mentioned, you, you are uh, everything blockchain, uh, and I'm leading uh, the charge in uh, Secutix in the Americas. We're recording on the 27th of July, so uh, all the disclosure being done. The reason I ask you to come on the show today is not to do a shameless promotion for the amazing technology we have, but because everybody's always asking, what is blockchain? How is this impacting uh, the live event industry? And uh, I've listened to several of your presentation. You obviously have tremendous experience with all of that. And I thought you would be the perfect person uh, to explain all of this. But before we get there, I uh, would like to know, what is Rafa Jimenez's journey? Oh, that's a big question. I think the, the, the shortest way to summarize it is I'm a tech geek, uh, engineer, developer, turned turned management consultant, turned fintech entrepreneur, turned blockchain expert. And I'm I'm now here at Secretiques with Elka Group leading uh, everything blockchain, metaverse, uh, digital assets. That's the short, short explanation. That's awesome. And... and how did you get into uh, this fintech world, uh, financial technology yeah. world? Yeah. Uh, maybe, I don't know, if you want to go back to uh, when you're yeah. consulted and the clients that's you're the, working with? Yeah, that's definitely a good way to unpack it would be. So I've always been a, a, a tech uh, lover, nerd, uh, consumer, you know, first uh, cowboy, uh, what do you call it? cowboy, uh, first users, uh, first movers, anything that came out as I was growing up, the technology, I had to have it, I had to try it and use it. And I would take it apart back in the time where you could take apart Ataris and uh, Commodore 64s, you could still see the components. Oh, wow. You, uh, you were opening the box. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you burned out a, a capacitor, sometimes you could smell it and you just open it up and you can unsolder it and solder it. I, I used to do that kind of stuff back in the day. And so I, I was always interested by that. I started programming early in Pascal or early, I don't know, middle, uh, mid nineties in Pascal and stuff, you know, you know uh, and I got very much into it. So I I went to the electronic engineering uh, uh, undergraduate route developing integrated systems uh, for communications uh, applications. I graduated in 2001 in the middle of the uh, tech bubble crash and post 9-11. Uh, yeah. So there was really no job. Uh, they were firing 5,000 engineers uh, in Mexico. I was in uh, central Mexico and Guadalajara at the time. I'm originally from Tijuana. So this is hence my, uh, my very American uh, accent. A and so... I had to find another career in a sense because the whole industry was for the next two years was sort of just uh, frozen, mm -hmm. especially for a new uh, recently graduated. So I started teaching math and in high school. And in doing that, you have to manage 30, 40 kids and you have to sort of like sell the idea of math because nobody just wants to learn math when they're 12 years right. old or 13 or 15. You have to sort of sell it and market that to them. I think that was the first time that I started developing the other side of my brain. I used to be this very classic, like, you know, focused on the math, focused on the programming, uh, not so much about talking to other people and understanding other needs. And so I started opening it up to that. And that's when I decided eventually to go do an MBA a few years later. Uh, by 2005, I was doing my MBA here in Switzerland, actually. This is when I moved to Switzerland. I got a uh, scholarship from the Swiss government. I came to do my MBA and uh, learned about the world of consulting 
and management, strategic management consulting at the time. I joined uh, McKinsey in 2006. Uh, I was excited to join, uh, to start a, a career that didn't necessarily force me to pick a certain industry. I mean, I, you know, within consulting, I yeah. could work in projects in different industries because at the time my, my mind was just exploding with information. I loved it. And I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, banking, pharma, insurance, all the options that you have across industries. And so I went into consulting as a way to learn more about the different industries and work in them before. Um, having uh, That led me, this was 2006. So this was six, seven, and even up until 08, there was a lot of work with um, with clients, uh, you know, global leaders of finance, banks, insurance companies, where we had projects for them uh, as a consultant because of the growth that you were seeing in those years, right before mm -hmm. the 2008 uh, end of the you know, crisis, financial crisis. So, so there was a lot of work. I worked in a lot of, um, I focused mostly on emerging market uh, development of new products uh, for financial institutions. This was also the time in 2007 when the smartphone came out, right? And so yes. if you put all those things into a pot, being from an emerging market myself and trying to help these the largest banks in the world, the largest insurance companies in the world to figure out how to expand or launch launch or expand the product in emerging markets like Eastern Europe or, or Asia or LATAM. I was even in some countries in LATAM. I realized that there was this big financial inclusion gap, right? There was this big gap of, of a certain percentage of people, the base of the pyramid in these countries, they were not it's just not possible to deliver financial services to them with the current technology and cost structure that these big banks and insurance companies had. And so when I saw by 2009 already, you could see clearly, and there was a study that came out of a think tank that said, and this is 2009 or 10, that said by, the, by 2020, you know, there's going to be 6 billion new smartphones and 80% of those are going to be in emerging markets. So the growth, and so you would really have for the first time in human history, you would have this big, it's called a, a, a leapfrog effect, where the base of the pyramid in the emerging markets, in the emerging mar world, which is the majority of the world, the base of the pyramid would go from not having internet access. Well, I mean, they could go to the to a internet cafe, but not having, right. you know, to having this, LG HTC smartphone that suddenly they have internet in the palm of their hand for the first time. Wow. And so I felt that that was so powerful and no, and, and having already tried to help these big, the biggest institutions in the world to try and expand and launch product in emerging markets, realizing the limitations that these products had, for example, a savings account in Mexico at the time in 2010, for example, uh, the cheapest savings account, you would have to have at least $400, no, $150 worth of uh, average balance, monthly balance. If you don't have that, then they're charging you something like $10 a month, hmm. right? If you don't at least have that. And so then 70% of the base of the pyramid in Mexico, well, in Latin America, according to a study from the Inter-American Development Bank, 70% uh, of them live on $10 purchasing parity power parity per day, purchasing power parity per day. So then these people, if they have savings, they're going to have maybe $50 worth. So mm -hmm. you can't open a bank account, leave $50 in there and be eating it away, having been eating it away at $5 or $10 right. a month. So these cost structures, they just don't work. So I fell in love with the idea of fintech at the time, fintech apps, 2010 and, and, and mobile only fintech apps. So you know, companies that started coming up in the late uh, 2000s, uh, 2009, 2010, that started to propose a solution on a mobile only where billions of people in emerging markets were going to, over the next 10 years, be able to access these services because all you need is a smartphone, right? And you could access financial services. So that was fintech back in 2010 or so. I fell in love with that. I decided I was going to leave consulting and start my own fintech company. So by 2012, I moved back to, oh, I, I, I founded a fintech company in Mexico, peer-to-peer -peer, mobile-only app that allowed people to transfer money between them. 
So I, I founded and I ran that company for eight years from 2012 to 2020. It basically connected all of the payment service providers and all of the payment options that you have in Mexico. Something to understand between a developed market like the US, Switzerland, Australia, et cetera, you usually tend to have one payment service provider or a very large one that covers all plastics and all payment methods. So if you just consume the API of Stripe or something like that, then you can charge anybody in Switzerland. It's not the case in a market like mm -hmm. Mexico. You need to, if you want to be able to charge anybody, anyone in Mexico, any amount anywhere in Mexico at any time, you need to consume about seven uh, different APIs. So you need to create, oh, wow. you need to create a backend that sort of is a smart backend. I call it a meta PSP. Yeah. So this is what we created in Mexico. We created this meta PSP that consumes all of the payment channels and then gives one front-end easy app to the end users as pay. And then all the logic in the back decides with, how to route the payment, how to charge it in the most efficient and the way possible. In that time, right before I started, actually right before I decided to leave consulting and I was ready to start my fintech in Mexico, I learned about Bitcoin, about blockchain. I learned in uh, about it in 2000, late 2011. Wow. A, for, a former uh, roommate of mine in Geneva, I was living in Geneva at the time, and former roommate of mine was working at, uh, as like the lead of security, cybersecurity of one of the big private banks. And he was already, he had gotten into it a few months prior. And as a developer, he was also participating, helping, you know, improve the code and the core and all that stuff. And so he started talking to me about it because as a former developer myself, I could sort of hang with the lingo, even though I hadn't touched the uh, code since 2000. So you were the people at the party that nobody understand what you're saying, but you were hanging around together all the time and yes. uh, having a lot of fun discussing tech, yes. right? So he told me about, about Bitcoin and I started asking questions how it works. And for me, that was like this, you know, this is the last leg. This is the, 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 the thing that was missing. Mm -hmm. Because even if you think that people now have an app, right? They have an app and they can access financial services through a fintech app. They still had to sort of connect a bank account to that app. And right. opening a bank account is something that is very hard or taxing for a lot of people in certain parts of the world. Not in this part of the world where you have uh, the Swiss mountains and stuff, but many parts of the world is very hard. And so, and so the idea of a a way to trade value, mm -hmm. right, and to, to to keep a store of value that just the only thing you require is a smartphone to open a wallet, and you can open it right away. Uh, that whole idea of blockchain decentralized finance at the time we didn't call it DeFi; it was just a decentralized ledger technology. Yeah. Understanding that led me to was I think the biggest moment where I the passion was born at that time. I just could not stop reading and learning about blockchain since to, since finding out about it. So I ended up spending the next eight years, half of my time running my fintech in Mexico. And half of my time going traveling throughout the world, because at the time you couldn't find much online. Mm -hmm. You had to go to these meetups in the middle of nowhere, right? <laughs> uh, so I was going to Silicon Valley. I was going to Zug here in, in Switzerland. I was yeah. going to the middle of the desert. To uh, I was going to Barcelona, some castles in the middle of nowhere where these people were meeting, Right just to listen to them talk about it to you know ask them about it to work with them to develop those ideas and so i've been and then of course i was always the very first user of everything that came out you know so anything that was available i would use it purchase it use it feedback to the creators which i had met in the previous meetup and so i've been doing that since 2012 and then i officially started helping a lot of these people who were friends of mine by now like as an advisor, as a consultant uh, in their projects. Uh, I started helping them in 2014. Many of the projects that have come since, yeah, layer one blockchains, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, uh, like the DAO, the original one, ICOs, uh, layer twos, uh, any type of DeFi projects, I've helped many of them. And then I officially realized in 2016, I realized that there wasn't much Spanish coverage of uh, online of information. There was a lot of English by then. 
And so I started teaching uh, blockchain in Spanish, uh, videos uh, and and uh, web, uh, that kind of stuff to explain to people in Spanish what it is. Yeah. Amazing. Sorry. It's absolutely I amazing. Go, I could go on and on, but yeah, this is my passion. So I can just talk about it for... You know, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, first, there is serendipity. Uh, because what is your roommate or the people you're meeting? But second yeah. is everything that you've done so far, which actually allows you to understand those conversations. Uh, if you come from another industry and you don't have that background and people are telling you about Bitcoin in, in uh, 2011, you yeah. might not see that this is the next leg that was missing. So yeah. I, I think it's fascinating. And I was listening to you and you mentioned you know, when, when uh, you were younger, that you, you were uh, opening the boxes of Atari and everything. It's yeah. interesting to me. Uh, I was playing with those boxes uh, and I also wanted to be a DJ. But I guess yeah. it, it was like 20 years too early that I, I would make a fortune with that. Yeah. To be honest, I don't remember which ones. I mean, I had like Texas Instruments. Yes, the TI-99. Yeah, yes. yeah, the the like the game console, not just the not just the yes. there used to be a game console. I know. I, My father more, was selling them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had Atari, I had uh, then Commodore 64, Genesis, Sega, Sega, then Genesis, Sega, Nintendo. Yeah. I had all those. So yeah, I love that thing. I remember, I remember, yeah, it's pretty cool. So I mean, now, I guess what. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Go I, ahead. I, I was just going to say, finalizing the arc, I returned to Switzerland in 2020 and I sort of stepped down from managing my company in Mexico. I really wanted to focus on DeFi and blockchain implementations. And I wanted to focus mostly on digital assets in mobile, in mobile only world with a larger uh, international facing type of project or company, right? Because my company in Mexico was always just about Mexico. Mm -hmm. And so I joined a company here in Switzerland that we were building, uh, it's called Alpian. We built the, it's about to launch actually, in, in a few months actually, the uh, Switzerland's first mobile only digital private bank. Wow. Right? That took a long time. We built it. Uh, we worked very hard. The license took a lot longer to come and so we couldn't launch. And so I stepped down as a chief commercial officer of the team. And I only stayed on as the um, advisor to the CEO. And so I'm still part of that project in that sense in advisory mode. Hopefully it'll, it'll be launching very soon. So it's a mobile only full end-to-end -end private bank service for uh, people in Switzerland, right? And after stepping down there, I was looking for an even larger project because again, Alpian was focusing on the Swiss market, even though it, 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 it might grow into Europe, but I was trying to find the world's largest something, right? The world's largest something who wants to implement or is implementing blockchain functions. And so that's when I came across uh, Elka with Secutix. And I said, wow, wow, it's one of the world's largest ticketing platforms and yep. they have this great technology. And so uh, Amazing. I, was asked, I was asked to join and, and lead it. So I'm, I'm happy, super happy to be here. That's awesome. And actually we could, could have crossed path because 2006, you mentioned... McKinsey, um, I had uh, the, the, the great uh, pleasure of organizing the uh, retreat, the annual retreat uh, of McKinsey in Switzerland when they were going outside Switzerland. So we might okay. have crossed path over there. Where, where, uh, where was this? Where, where was that retreat at? Oh, there were several. The first one, uh, remember, was uh, in Algarve in 2005. I wasn't but then there yet. Being, They've been Greece. They've been uh, Morocco. I was uh, I was in Greece. I was in Morocco, yes. probably. No, we so. were there. <laughs> so we were there. We just didn't meet we too many people. <laughs> and and you you were teaching math to forty kids, uh, while I was uh, taking care of forty kids at the club med. So a different setting, but uh, yeah, yeah, some, yeah. some similarities. Yeah. So we know now why you are so uh, expert in in blockchain and everything, and and your journey is fascinating. Now, before we, we end our conversation talking about, uh, obviously, the impact of blockchain on live event, uh, can we spend a little bit of time? Um, and, you know, it's always challenging for me, um, especially when I have all those engineers in my family, to ask them to speak in simple terms that people like me can understand. But yeah. if we can explain briefly what is blockchain, what is yeah. NFT, what is crypto, uh, yeah. because obviously we hear about it every day and not necessarily everyone knows what we're talking about. 
So I'll I'll do the I'll do the same I did when you asked me about my background, and I'll let you manage the time because I, <laughs> I I can either answer in a few seconds or I can go minute uh, hours. So uh, the short the short version of what a blockchain is, it is you change the paradigm that we have today between needing thousands of databases that have different information across the world, you need them to reconcile between them, right? Uh, so in the case of money, uh, you have tens of thousands of banks around the world. They each have their own database of who has what money, even within a country. I'm not talking about the whole world, but it's, you know. Mm -hmm. And so this is why it's so slow and so costly to send $50 from Switzerland to Mexico, right? Because... In that case, there might be three or four banks that have to be involved in the middle so that that transfer can happen. Because you have what, what is called a system of heterogeneous databases that need to clear and settle. That's the world today. Mm -hmm. So a blockchain is the fancy name or the marketing name for what is called a uh, distributed ledger technology. So it is the idea of saying instead of having a thousand ledgers, a thousand databases or accounting ledgers that need to all reconcile, let's just have one ledger in the world. Mm. And let's have that be a distributed ledger where we can all, in this kind of same idea as a cloud, we can all access it, see it. Everybody and nobody has it. Everybody and nobody owns it at the same time. It's everywhere. It can't be destroyed unless you destroy the whole internet, you know, or the you know vast majority of it. It cannot, et cetera. So that's the idea of saying, how can we keep track of an asset, right? In this case, you know, it potentially could be very soon a crypto dollar, for example, right? It is already the case of a crypto yuan. So China mm -hmm. already has his central bank digital currency. So very soon, I believe, there's going to be a single worldwide database or DLT, distributed ledger technology, which is a blockchain. There's going to be a single DLT in the world where we can all trade, uh, uh, send, transfer, and send dollars. So there will be no more need for this clearing and settlement and all these intermediaries that have to be involved to send money from one part of the world to another. I don't know if that's good enough. That, that it's, is a, a, it's a very good explanation. Listening to you, and I'm I'm not gonna. I'm just gonna share what I'm thinking. I'm not asking you uh, to answer that because <clears throat> it then might be in a diff difficult position. But when I hear about one centralized ledger in the world, yes, and when I hear what's going on in some countries where basically your uh, credit score is linked to your social score. So if, if you yeah. cross a pedestrian on the red light, you're losing points. It's okay. kind of frightening on one hand. Yeah. And on the other hand, uh, it's kind of exciting because obviously it's yeah. solving a lot of problems. So I hope in yeah. the future, don't say anything about it, but I hope in the future, people like you are involved with that. We will yeah. we'll find a way to, to balance those, those two uh, extremes for me. So... But thank you yeah. for that. So blockchain, um, very good. How about NFT, the non-fungible token? And we've okay. heard so many different things. Obviously, we're going to talk yeah. about ticketing and, and the meetings and event. But yeah. we heard about art being sold for $65 million, uh, for yeah. an NFT. I mean, yeah. uh, what is it exactly and, and uh, what can be done for, for anybody in the public? Yeah. So... In this simple explanation of a blockchain being a single ledger that is distributed and everyone can access it, there's a lot of advantages. There's a lot of challenges that needed to be solved and are still being solved for it to actually work at scale. And so it has already worked in the case of Bitcoin, for example, meaning that where you can exchange value as long as people value a Bitcoin, right? You can exchange Bitcoin all over the world. And I'm just saying Bitcoin because it's the oldest and most widely used and a cryptocurrency uh, in the world. And so it works. It, people have tried to attack it. People have tried to stop it. People have tried to uh, gamify it, whatever. It's not, nobody's been able to do it. Now, hundreds of millions of people around the world have been using it to trade billions of dollars worth of value. 
Okay, that's just one application of a blockchain, right? There are hundreds that we can think about today, and I believe thousands that we've yet to think about that will come up in the future. Now, one of the more recently exciting applications of a blockchain is an NFT. So a non-fungible token. First of all, I think a lot of the challenge with understanding blockchain and cryptocurrencies is that most of us don't have a deep enough understanding of money, how the money works, and also uh, how computers work. And it, John Oliver, if I, I like to follow him. He has this joke where he says, like, you know, the problem with cryptocurrency is that it's everything you don't understand about money together with everything you don't understand about computers, <laughs> right? And so the fungible, this word, it's a it's a property of money, which means that money needs to be fungible, means that if I give you a $20 bill, you can return to me four or $5 bills or two $10 bills or a different $10 bill, not a different $20 bill, not the one I gave you yesterday. I don't care. You could return to me, you could just send me a Venmo uh, payment for $20. I don't care. It's completely fungible. It's replaceable by any other form of, of, of payment. That, so the, a, a, a dollar is a token, which is a fungible token, if you will. Yes. It is not 100% fungible because it is still possible to track the serial number of a dollar bill. Right. And if for whatever reason this has been stolen, then you can sort of like, you know, have a tainted bill because you know that this was stolen something. So mm -hmm. it's not 100% fungible. Cash isn't 100% fungible. So the question is, what is a non-fungible token or 0% fungible and why do you need one? An example of a non-fungible token that exists today before blockchain even existed is the title, the deed, the title to your house or your car. Mm -hmm. This piece of paper, the pink slip of your car, right, is a non-fungible asset. Meaning if I give you this piece of paper today, just because I'm going to lend it to you or, you know, et cetera, a week from now, I need that same exact piece of paper because that's my car. I don't want another piece of paper of another car. I want my car. That's So it has to be, that is the concept of non-fungible, something that is unique and identifiable and it cannot okay. be copied. And then you can trade these non-fungible tokens because it represents ownership of something. It's unique ownership. Now, the problem with non-fungible tokens before the existence of a blockchain is that I could have one database where I say, look, here is the digital deed to this painting. I painted this and I'm going to create, they are called UUIDs, universally unique identifiers. And in my database, which is rafasgallery.com, right, I'm going to create a unique digital certificate for this painting. And I'm mm -hmm. going to sell you this certificate. The problem is that then Eric can create his own registry in another part of the world. And your registry, your database is not going to automatically update itself or sync with mine because they're different databases. Mm. But suddenly, now that we have a unique ledger yeah. that in any distributed ledger all over the world, for example, and just to be clear for people listening, of course, there can then be one blockchain per asset. So there's a blockchain for Bitcoin, there's a blockchain for Ethereum, there's a blockchain for et cetera. So uh, in the case of non-fungible uh, tokens, NFTs, mostly most of the, of the usage in the world of NFTs is being done on the Ethereum blockchain. So on the Ethereum distribute, unique distributed ledger technology, I can register a digital asset whether it be a painting, whether it be a song, whether it be a percentage ownership of a company I created on the blockchain. You can create companies that are called DAOs, Distributed yep. Autonomous Organizations. These are companies that are not registered in any country. They are registered on, on a blockchain. And I could create shares of this DAO and tokenize them. I'm not sure you would do it as NFTs, but you can tokenize them, right? And so... I can create NFTs. Yeah, I, you would probably do it as an ERC eleven fifty five or something like that. But anyway, I'm not going to go to that. Uh, you just that. lost me on this one. Yes, yes, it's another. Uh, so NFTs on Ethereum 
follow something called ERC721, which is uh, Ethereum request for comments. So in Ethereum, there's in the Ethereum world, there's EIPs, so e e Ethereum improvement proposals. These are proposals that are uh, by the community, open source community, where they propose to improve the underlying protocol mm. of Ethereum. Okay. So EIP, and they, they're they just numbered because people are discussing every day all over the world. And so now come we're going to discuss number 5,732, right? And so they discuss it. And most of these in proposals go nowhere. They get discussed. Some of them actually get implemented and now they become famous, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a famous EIPs, proposals, improvements that have been in, implemented in the past. So the same thing happens for ERCs. So ERCs is Ethereum request for comments. So this is because, uh, so then somebody comes up with an idea and say, we're not going to change Ethereum, but let's create a, a, a way in Ethereum to have non-fungible tokens. And that request for comment was number 721 in order. And so they all agreed and then the NFTs on Ethereum were born. And now they are called ERC-721s. And so the way you create a non-fungible token on the unique worldwide distributed ledger of Ethereum is by following the ERC-721 rules or protocol. Got it. Okay. And what happened with this, this piece of art that was sold, I think, for $65 million last year or two years ago? Is it the Beeple one? Yes. Beeple? Yeah. So Beeple is an artist that's been doing digital art uh, for more than 20 years. Now, the problem with digital art before the arrival of a blockchain that allows you to globally register a unique non-fungible token where everyone can verify that this is the unique one. All you need is access to the Ethereum blockchain, mm. which you can have by downloading an app in a few seconds in any phone. So before that, he would create a digital asset and that digital asset itself is a picture, a digital picture, ones and zeros on a database, right? On a, some server. So anyone could make a copy of his digital artwork and own it and see and show it on their phone and everything. And there was no way for any one of us to know which one was the original copy. Understood. You can't, you know, does, see, it doesn't matter how good a painter you find, they're going to make a replica that is almost exactly like the Mona Lisa, yeah. but there's going to be an expert in the world who's going to be able to tell the difference between the real Mona Lisa and the, and the, and the almost exact copy. In the case of a digital artwork, you can make an exact copy where nobody can tell the difference. And that was a problem before. And that's why he couldn't monetize his work because there was no way for people to prove that this is a real one. Now, once NFTs enter the space, it is 100%. Uh, you can now verify with 100% certainty that yeah. whoever owns the original certificate, it's not who owns Got the it. picture. Because no, if you I think about it. it, it's not who's holding the Mona Lisa. I could run in, steal it, and run away and hide it. But if I don't have the certificate that says that I own the Mona Lisa, then it doesn't matter. The, what, what really is worth is the certificate of ownership. So the yeah. NFT is literally just a certificate of ownership of a digital asset. Got it. It's and so in this particular asset. case, uh, we know who owns it and uh, also... What I, I thought was very interesting for any artist is that because it's a smart contract and you can put the rules, basically yes. the artist um, is selling his art once. Yeah. But in this case, they can put in the contract that every time that the art is sold to somebody else, the artist, the original artist is still going to get a commission on that. Exactly. Well, that's that's also possible, right? There's ways to get around it as well. But yes, I yeah. mean, the answer is it's cool. possible. Rafa, yeah. I, I, I can listen to you for hours. And, and obviously, I understand now why uh, the uh, 40 children would love Matt, because uh, <laughs> you, you explain it. Uh, although you're an engineer, you explain it very well. <laughs> well I, I had to learn to do that. I to, the problem is then I just go on and on. It's like, no, 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 no. I, 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 I love it. it. But uh, I, I really want to finish our conversation today and, and speak about uh, really the, the elephant in the room. 
Um, there's a lot of issues uh, in uh, live events and when it comes to ticketing, when it comes to fraud, to uh, bots buying tickets. Uh, we're going to talk about some of uh, issues that I even encountered uh, last week uh, when I was looking at uh, buying a ticket for uh, one of the artists I love the most. Um, so what is in your view, with all your experience and, and what we're doing now with the uh, CQTX, what is the application of blockchain uh, for the live event industry? I think there's there's three type of tokens that will help in different parts of it. So there is the fungible tokens. So these are tokens that you can use as payment within a certain club or, or company. So if you think of airline miles, airline miles has been for decades a, a currency that only exists within any given airline or group of airlines. Right. Right. And you get it by doing certain things. You get it as an award and you can spend it to buy more tickets or even buy stuff in the Sky Mall, uh, whatever. Uh, yeah. You know, so that's so fungible. These are fungible tokens. Yes. These before blockchain and still today exist as database tokens. Yes. Fungible database tokens that exist, for example, between in the miles and more group. Yeah. Right. So, oh, I've got a million miles. And so I'm rich in that world. I can only use it there. So this same type of, of, of mechanism, which we know works commercially very well to promote a, a certain user base can be brought into, uh, you know, big clubs, tournaments that have a fan base. So you can do that same model and create an internal coin or yeah. miles within the ecosystem of a particular tournament or or artist or sports club. I think we're going to definitely see that happening. And then instead of doing it with a database token, which is very easily uh, gamified and you do it with, and it's called an ERC-20 or similar token, which is Ethereum request for comment number 20, which is when they created these tokens that you can run on Ethereum. So that's so number one. So this is the first. Uh, I think the second thing, as we've discussed, is NFTs all, also already, because I don't think necessarily that the ticket itself becomes an NFT. We don't need to go there necessarily. A ticket could still be a database ticket. But uh, you could start with commemorative. So when the event, when the mm. event is over, and I've got, been to the event, we don't realize today, I think fans today might not realize that when you use a digital ticket, you don't have a part of the experience that you used to have. So I have my ticket when I went to the World Cup in 2006 to see Mexico versus Argentina. I have the physical, beautiful ticket like in my house, you know? So that part of the souvenir memorabilia part of it is sort of lost when you go to mobile ticketing. And so I think one of the first low-hanging fruit is to say, well, you now get your commemorative digital art ticket, mm -hmm. which this is clearly a, a great implementation for NFT technology, Yep. right? Uh, and so that's the other kind of tokens. And then there's a middle token between a fungible and a non-fungible token, which I think is ERC-1155. So you sure it's not 1156? I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> you can Google that. I think it's 1155. This is, <laughs> this is when you create, uh, I, might, I might be wrong, but check me out. <laughs> but, uh, this is when you create a group of tokens that are distinguishable one group to another, but mm -hmm. among them, they are not. So this is like saying, I'm going to create 10,000 shares of my company. And then if I give you this share and I send you back another share, you're not going to care which share I send you because mm. between them, it's all the same. It's a share. But it is differentiated between the share of this company and the share of that company. So that's also possible to do. And then we're talking about fan engagement and governance, for example. Yes. A lot of the, a lot of the clubs are, are trying to think how they can include their fan base more in the governance of the club and the decisions of, you know, and 
I think it's a very, that's, I think that's for me, that's the longest one. It's going to take longer to work out, but, but the technology is already there. So the technology in these forms of tokens is already there. So these are just three examples. I mean, there's probably dozens more. Mm -hmm. Um, All of these things will enable all the, will, will minimize the, the current problems that we see in the ticketing industry and enable a lot of the potential that we would like to do. Um, so, for instance, the issues of security, the yes. instant, the issues of a false ticket, the yes. issues of bots uh, buying tickets, and then you yes. have to, to go on the secondary market for twice the price. Yes. Everything is now technically it's possible to uh, to basically uh, fought all those issues. It's uh, you address them, and I think the key word here is address. A lot of the people who are not who don't understand technology that deeply think that in order to stop, well, let's take bots. In order to stop bots, you need to create a, a code, a bot that stops the bots. And a lot of, that's, just like a, that's just like an arms race. that you, you can't really stop it that way. The way to stop bots is to create a community of engaged fans and the community stops the bots. Mm. And the way, that you, the way that you sell the tickets, right? There is no business case for the black market to run their bots. So in a way, think about this. There aren't any bots that are out there buying the last tickets of an airline flight and then trying, because you can't resell that ticket, right? Yeah. Uh, Now, is it because people can't, uh, you know, you can write up a script that goes and 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 tries to buy up the easy jet comes up with a new it's high season in Ibiza and they need a new a new flight and they come up with a new flight from London to Geneva to Ibiza and i could have a bot just sniffing and waiting and when that comes up buys up all of the all of the fly, all of these you know 300 tickets and then goes on the secondary market and resells it well you can't do that because why because technically you can't no because it's not a business there's no right. business to be made because you can't resell the tickets, mm-hmm. right? And so if you create this closed environment where people have their own miles and only the fans, right? So you can't go to that extreme. I'm not going to go into details, but the solutions are are very, very different, very widely. Uh, on a case-by-case basis, they, they vary. However, you can be sure in saying that including blockchain, adding blockchain and DLT technologies and digital Mm -hmm. assets technology like Mm -hmm. NFTs, adding all this to the ticketing industry will most certainly address and minimize most of the problems we see today. Yeah. Most certainly. And it will open up opportunities. Every opportunity that we think of today will be possible. But that's not what I'm excited about. I'm excited about all the opportunities we can't even imagine today. And that's like saying, if imagine we're talking in 1990, 1999 about the internet. And then we're saying, oh, can you imagine you're going to be able to order a cab on yellowcab.com and just click on your, and then say tomorrow at 6 a.m., pick me up, right? And pay with your credit card. Yeah, that sounds great. But that's what we can imagine now. In 1999, mm. nobody could imagine that right. ten years that ten years later there yeah. was going to be something called an app, right? And you could click one button, and in a few minutes, wherever you are in the world, arguably, right, there's going to be a car that's going to come pick you up and take you, and yeah, that's it's going to be so nobody could even imagine that. And that's, I think, the situation where we are now. I think mm-hmm. in the ticketing industry. As we continue to introduce blockchain, NFT, and digital asset technology, uh, that includes also something called SSI, which we won't go into detail, which is called self-sovereign identity. Self-sovereign identity is a way to manage, uh, for example, single sign-on and identification and verification, Mm -hmm. which is very closely tied to uh, blockchain technology. And so that will also become available. And so we're going to address all these problems, minimize them, we're, and we're going to allow a lot of the great things we can think about right now, but we're also going to create new things that nobody's ever imagined. So it's going to be uh, awesome. that. That's really exciting. Uh, when I, I'm listening to you, uh, that's for sure. And 
obviously uh, in the right spot to do that. You know, I, I was just, again, thinking of what you're saying and the issues in, in the industry, uh, the false ticket, um, mm. the printed false ticket, that, that is the issue that is solved. Uh, mm. When you get the, uh, the digital one, we, we've seen, we have example in case study with that. Uh, when you use the digital one, the um, entry is uh, m- much more secure. You know who's coming in and faster, uh, and you get all the fans on time uh, in, in the stadium or in a venue to start with. Yeah. Uh, knowing who's coming, obviously very important. Yeah. What I'm also looking at is the technology is available and it also depends on the artist. Last week, if you want to buy a ticket to Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, whom I love, I love Bruce Springsteen, I love the boss, I love Steven Van Zandt, I, I just love them. The dynamic pricing that is used in this case came up to the fact that if you wanted to buy a middle uh, seat ticket, it was going up to four or 5,000 a ticket. Mm. I got a family of five. I am not going to spend 20,000 to go and see the <laughs> boss one evening. And at the opposite, and full disclosure, uh, Ed Sheeran is using uh, our technology, Ticks and Go. But Ed Sheeran said, I want my real fan, my true fan, to be able to come to my show and pay a reasonable price and he is using technology to, yeah. to basically do that. And people cannot resell more than the face value. So it's also technology is there, but it's also the decision of the artist, of the organizer or the promoter uh, of yeah. what they want to do or maximize the revenue or, or basically make sure that the, the true fan can come, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's this is why I decided to join uh, uh, Secretix when it came to live events. Because it is not, you know, blockchain, uh, NFTs, this is not a magical pill that you take, that you, you take and it solves everything. It's actually, in many cases, a blockchain is not just not needed. And sometimes it's, it, it can be detrimental to the solution that you're trying to do. Because a blockchain has something called uh, the blockchain trilemma, which is you cannot maximize three things at the same time. You have to pick between security security decentralization and scalability or speed. Mm -hmm. So you can maximize two of the three, but not all three at the same time. So in some cases, it's detrimental. So you need to understand what it's good for, what are the limitations, and when a solution requires experience and other type of systems, right? So Secretix has that, I don't know, almost 20 years experience managing these types of events. And so... In the case of Bruce Springsteen, the example you were giving, if it, I'm not very familiar with it, well, uh, somewhat, but if it is dynamic pricing of the primary market, so if you're trying yes, to, yes, it is, yeah. If, if you're trying to, if if you're trying to price the ticket based on demand, the way, for example, Uber does it when there's a lot of demand and there's two yeah. x pricing, three x pricing, then you need to be sure that you don't have bots that are pumping up the demand. Absolutely, right. Yep. And if you try to solve that from a technology perspective, it's just an arms race. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not going to work, right? And so, and then so you get something like this happening, right? Uh, on the other hand, if you approach it from an ecosystem solution, a global ecosystem solution, where you have down the line, you have limitations of how tickets can be transferred. If you have limitation and control on the on the full ticket lifecycle, then you ensure that there are no bots coming in to the primary purchase because the companies, people or companies that are trying to profit from this realize that there is no way down the line that they will be able to profit. Mm-hmm. And so they just never come in. Yes. It just doesn't make sense. And so, and so yeah, um, this is where it's good to have a company that understands the industry who is then now saying, okay, this is how we're going to, and this is the great, position that I find myself in is I get to now say, okay, this is a part of blockchain that we're going to add here, Mm -hmm. right? Because the rest of it is already there, right? The rest of it is already built, right? Okay, that that makes a lot of sense. And I can see why it's it's exciting, uh, not only for uh, the technology, but how you can apply it and and why you like what, what you're doing. My last question for today, it's all about the data. Um, yeah. Everybody knows when you're talking about fan engagement, what you're doing, it's all about the data and owning your own data. 
I never understood the last years when I was speaking with people that basically outsource the ownership of their own data with whoever, uh, which is not their, their own organization. But moving forward, if you look at the future, merging technology and what's available today, the needs of uh, the fans, the patrons, and the needs of the artists and the promoter. Can you see in the, in the near future an artist basically owning his or her own database, knowing exactly who are their fans throughout the world, being able to engage directly with them, being able to sell directly tickets to them, and being able to even have some prices that if you buy through the official channel of the artist, there is a meet and greet and stuff like that. So basically, there's going to change the entire landscape of the, the live entertainment industry. It's a big question. <laughs> um, it has a lot of parts and I would have to unpack it to answer it. Um, I would say in general, long-term, uh, you know, five to 10 years, yes. Artists, yes. And to the uh, careful with the answer. Yes, artists, uh, clubs, tournaments will be able to engage directly with their fans right? And provide services to them, ticketing or otherwise, directly, right? But I would say that part of the paradigm that is changing that we are not, that if I tell, if what I'm about to say, if you if you take what I'm about to say and you look back at the last five, four or five years, you can start connecting the dots. What is happening is that it is, it very soon will no longer be about the data. In the, it'll no longer be about owning your customer's data, right? Very soon, it'll be about empowering your customers, your users, your fans. They own their data and they allow you to see what they want you to see. And, and they consume what they want from you in a pull marketing, not a push marketing mindset. Interesting. Right? I mean, yes. we even call them push notifications. It's like push, we're pushing, we're pushing. And, and what is happening with real-time information, with the advent of, again, people should go read up on this if they haven't, uh, self-sovereign identity, which is another way to manage uh, identification and verification online. It's a whole different paradigm. With the advent of that, the ownership of data is being returned and the power and control is being returned to the end user. And the companies, in this case, the artists, the uh, the uh, the clubs that work with platforms that understand that so that they can be there and ready to provide any service that their fans want in real time, instantly, right? And fans want to transfer their ticket, boom, one click, easy. Mm. The companies that do that are the ones that are going to, that are going to be the backbone. And these are the, the, um, the, uh, these are the these are the this is the infrastructure that is going to be used, and these are the artists and the clubs that use this infrastructure are the ones that are going to make that leap uh, into this new world. Um, Wonderful, Rafa. Thank you so much. You just mentioned something uh, a book uh, you met upon this. Is that the the name of the book? I'm sorry. You you just say something about people should read. Uh, 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 they should read uh, on SSI. I mean, oh, on, on the, SSI. Is, any, self, any one book that you want to recommend? Self-sovereign identity. <laughs> That's a hard question. I have many books that I want to recommend on different subjects. Um, Something that some, someone like me could understand. Yeah. Let's see. And don't yeah. say Dora the Explorer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't particularly push. Uh, I don't particularly push uh, Bitcoin as a... Yeah. So I don't particularly push Bitcoin... Uh, over any other cryptocurrency or digital asset. Right. The reason why I mention Bitcoin often is, is because it is the most tested, weathered, battle-tested, proven blockchain out there. Okay. And so I think it's very important for people to understand it yes. so that they can get a general understanding of blockchain and, and, and the future of digital assets. Okay. So with that caveat, I would recommend you read the Bitcoin standard. Okay. It's called. It's a, it's a guy named Seyfedin Amos, and so the Bitcoin Standard discusses basically. I think the title of the book something like the decentralized alternative to 
central bank or something like that. And so it is very much focused on this alternative to money. Yes. But but you learn about a decentralized ledger technology by you learn about these decentralized mindset. And 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 part of the answer I gave you your pre to your last question, which was it's no longer about owning the data of my fans in the future. That's coming from a centralized world where in order to compete, you needed to own it. In a decentralized world, you don't own anything anymore. You as a company, your fans own their own data, right? And they manage it. And so you need to start to understand these decentralized mindsets, right? And I think the Bitcoin standard, specifically with the example of Bitcoin, which is now, what, uh, 2009, so it's going on 13 years old. Yeah. I think it's the best specific awesome. application to understand this decentralized mindset and what a blockchain is, et cetera. So I look forward to discussing uh, whatever you learned from that book uh, next time. Thank you so much for your time, Rafa. Thank you for sharing uh, all your knowledge. Uh, very exciting, a lot of perspective. So uh, I'm sure uh, we're going to be talking a lot about it in the future. And uh, if anyone had any question, how could I reach you? Let's see. Let me give out my Twitter. Let's see. Uh, so it's at uh, RJ Games. You want me to write that down, maybe? Uh, at RJ Games. Yeah, I'm putting it in the chat here. And so that's my uh, that's my Twitter. And then oh, R. So at RJ Games, where and Games is uh, G A M E Z. Yes. Yes. Got it. And then uh, and then I guess I could do my. Uh, Secretix email. So absolutely. Um, here we go. So that's so the, Rafa. the Twitter is at R J G A M E Z. And the email is Rafa R A F A dot Jimenez J I M E N E Z at Secretix.com. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can put those in post production underneath or something. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, let, let's get back to uh, those mountains behind you. And uh, looking forward to seeing you soon. Thanks a Hi, lot. Eric. Thank you. Bye-bye. Rafa, thank you so much for sharing all your insights. Amazing experience and fascinating future and exciting future. Thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with your network. And if you want to connect with me, follow me on LinkedIn. Thank you.